Thank you all for coming after lunch. I'll, uh, yeah, this is the kind of after lunch snooze time, so I will try and keep, I'll I'll try and keep you awake. So mm -hmm. the slides, I hope, as, <coughs> as a good start, it will try and, try and keep you awake. Uh, so for about a year now, I've been studying what politicians and the mainstream media in Britain are describing as major reforms, those are the words used, to the British welfare state. Uh, but if one takes the trouble to look carefully at what's going on, what I want to argue today, it becomes very clear that these so-called reforms are actually an act of political assault on the welfare state, uh, the demolition, systematic demolition of its principles and practices. Uh, the coalition government that came to power uh, in May 2010, led by the Conservative Party, with an alliance with the Liberal Democrats, but they're very much the junior partner in this coalition, they've transformed a crisis of capitalism into a crisis of the welfare state blaming everything on the previous Labour government for spending too much money on social services and welfare benefits, uh, even though that government was hardly generous. As a consequence of the Welfare Reform Bill, which was passed by Parliament just this March, half a million people will have their disability living allowance taken away. People with serious illnesses are being stripped of their employment and support allowance after undergoing the ordeal of a points-based assessment by a private corporation. Housing benefit has been capped, which means that people of low incomes, among them over a million pensioners, will no longer be able to make rent uh, in many cities in the UK, particularly those living in expensive central city districts, leading to eviction displacement and social suffering on a scale we've not seen before uh, in the UK, at least since, uh, uh, since the end of World War II, and especially in London, which is the most expensive city. Uh, from next year, unemployed people will stand to lose benefits for three months if they refuse the offer of a job, or community work for the first time, six months if they refuse an offer twice, and three years if they refuse an offer three times. Now, you might think that there would be sympathy for such vulnerable people out of a sense of human decency, <coughs> but quite the opposite has happened. Taking away support from the disabled, the unemployed, and the working poor has actually proved to be very popular, the most popular policy of the coalition government to date. This is because of an ongoing campaign of vilification, even demonization. Those in receipt of benefits are almost always depicted by the media, by politicians, by think tanks in particular, more on those in a second, as feckless, workshy scroungers living in opulent quasi-mansions with wall-to-wall -wall widescreen TVs, rampaging around cities courtesy of handouts from the hard-working and long-suffering taxpayer. As the economic crisis that began four years ago created a national unemployment crisis, there are now over six million people looking for full-time work, the scrounger caricature, perversely, has become more and more popular. In the wake of the riots in English cities last August, the sociologist Paul Gilroy, <coughs> he remarked that we need, and I quote, a better understanding of the relationship between information and power, to understand the social and political context of urban marginality. So with this in mind, what I want to do in this paper is offer an analytic interrogation of a new political and media catchphrase for urban poverty in Britain. And that catchphrase is, a broken society. And a specific geography is at work here. The catchphrase rests on the mobilization of images of particular urban places as dysfunctional, where welfare dependency is seen as a spreading disease, a lifestyle choice made by troubled families, that's the official rhetoric, living amongst each other. Central to my account is the influence of a non-state agency which has profound and far-reaching state effects. This is a right-wing think tank called the Centre for Social Justice, a wonderful example of Orwellian doublespeak. It's an institution that feeds and guides the domestic policies of the coalition government. So, several English cities were up in flames for five nights in August last year. The events began following a peaceful evening protest outside a police station on Tottenham High Road in North London. Uh, at, and this was a protest at the police killing of somebody called Mark Duggan, a father of four, <laughs> age 29. Not long after the protest concluded, a 16-year-old girl approached police officers to voice her anger and was beaten back with batons. Two police cars, a bus and several shops were then attacked, looted and set ablaze in Tottenham, and anger soon spread to nearby areas, and then to other English cities. Nearly 4,000 people were arrested, <coughs> and all of them have now been brought before the courts of which over 1,500 have been convicted and sentenced. The court data available show a multi-ethnic demographic, but a majority of those arrested were young, over half age between 18 and 24. 90% were male, 
and with a previous caution and conviction, 73%. Crucially, most live in areas classified in government databases as multiply deprived, and 66% of those areas became even more deprived between 2007 and 2010. Politicians instructed judges to get tough, and they did. For example, a 23-year-old student with no criminal record was sentenced to a prison term of six months for stealing a bottle of water worth £3.50. Those convicted of burglary were sentenced to an average of 14.1 months in prison, nearly double the usual rate. Culprits of violent disorder, uh, 10.4 months, again, double the usual rate. Those nabbed for theft received sentences three times as long. So, there was a lightning-fast reaction from the penal wing of the state, which must be placed in context. Not a single person in the UK has yet gone to jail for their role in the financial meltdown in 2008. <laughs> So in the aftermath, there was a torrent of short commentaries on these events uh, by several rock stars of sociology, uh, but most were written in haste and actually of rather limited analytic value. And as I see it, it's by scrutinizing the political response to the riots that we can actually learn a great deal about urban marginality and its causes in Britain. On the 15th of August, this man, Prime Minister David Cameron, <coughs> visited a youth centre in his rural Oxfordshire hometown a youth centre that he had rescued from funding cuts that are shutting down many other youth centres simply because it was in his hometown, uh, to outline his government's response to the riots. And I want to quote at length from this speech. Uh, it's not something I enjoy doing, because Cameron, I just feel unwell, actually, when, when Cameron is speaking, but I'm, I'm going to quote uh, a, 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 an extract from this, uh, this speech he gave. This is the first speech he gave in response to the riots, a week after they'd sort of died down. So here we go. Now that the fires have been put out and the smoke has cleared, the question hangs in the air. Why? How could this happen on our streets and in our country? These riots were not about poverty. No, this was about behavior. People showing indifference to right and wrong. People with a twisted moral code. People with a complete absence of self-restraint. One of the biggest lessons of these riots is that we've got to talk honestly about behavior, because bad behavior has literally arrived on people's doorsteps. <coughs> Do we have the determination to confront the slow-motion moral collapse that has taken place in parts of our country these past few generations? In my very first act as leader of this party, I signalled my personal priority in politics, to mend our broken society. That passion is stronger today than ever. Let me start with families. I don't doubt that many of the rioters out last week have no father at home. Perhaps they come from one of those neighbourhoods where it's standard for children to have a mum and not a dad which I didn't think was biologically possible, but never mind. Mm. Where it's normal for young men to grow up without a male role model looking to the streets for their father figures, filled up with rage and anger. So if we want to have any hope of mending our broken society, family and parenting is where we've got to start. But one of the biggest parts of this social fight back is fixing the welfare system. For years we've had a system that encourages the worst in people, that incites laziness, that excuses bad behaviour, that erodes self-discipline, that discourages hard work. Above all, that drains responsibility away from people. There is a moral hazard in our welfare system, people thinking they can be as irresponsible as they like because the state will always bail them out, which strikes me as a wonderful description for finance and banking uh, executives. Uh, I want us to look at toughening up the conditions for those who are out of work and receiving benefits and speeding up our efforts to get all those who can work back into work. Work is at the heart of a responsible society because it's only by getting our young people into work that we can build an ownership society in which everyone feels they have a stake. So in response to the riots, I will say this. This should become a great national effort. I've talked a lot about what the government is going to do, but let me be clear. This social fight back is not a job for government on its own, because whatever the arguments, we all belong to the same society, and we all have a stake in making it better. There is no them and us, there is us. We are all in this together, he says that all the time, and we will mend our broken society together. Right, um, it's very tempting to dismiss this relentless invocation of responsibility as sort of sanctimonious chutzpah or bilious drivel, um, but the backbone is this rhetoric of a broken society, and that actually requires analytic uh, interrogation uh, rather than dismissal. So broken Britain, uh, in fact, became a catchphrase of the 2010 general election, aided by the Rupert Murdoch-owned tabloid press, which devoted considerable quantities of ink to this new moral panic. In The Sun, which is the highest-selling newspaper in the UK, numerous celebrities were enlisted to offer their own manifestos for fixing broken Britain. 
The fascinating and ultimately disturbing story behind this rhetoric speaks volumes about the truncation and distortion of public understanding in respect of the ongoing articulation of poverty, social class, and space uh, in British society. Although he, claims it's not his, it, although he claims it's his personal priority, mending a supposedly broken society is not actually David Cameron's idea. He just borrowed it from his work and pension secretary, Ian Duncan Smith, that's that man. Uh, he used to be leader of the Conservative Party 2001 to 2003, and it was, was not a, a good time for the Conservative Party when he was in charge. But during his tenure as leader, uh, he visited one of the poorest urban areas of the UK, Easter House in Glasgow. And he described it as follows, a, a, a wrecked and dreadful setup with families locked into generational breakdown, poverty, drug addiction, and so on. Um, and then he, he said something which I'm still not sure about, because he said, and, then, and that really does confront you with the thought that we did this. And it's ambiguous as to whether he means it was uh, maybe the Conservatives under Thatcher that, that led to this uh, deprivation, the legacy of that, or whether he's actually saying we did this, meaning that the welfare state actually <coughs> created uh, this kind of, uh, kind of neighbourhood. So the interview which was conducted in the New Statesman magazine, it wasn't actually clear as to what he meant by we did this, so you can leave that to your own judgement. Um, in 2004, in an effort to get the supposedly modernising Conservatives to enter the electorally significant uh, area of poverty and welfare, I, uh, Ian Duncan Smith established a think tank, the Centre for Social Justice, with this mission statement, to put social justice at the heart of British politics and to build an, un uh, an alliance of poverty-fighting organisations in order to see a reversal of social breakdown in the UK. And if you go to their website, uh, you're bombarded by two words, breakdown and broken. Uh, nowhere on it, or in any of its publications, and there are loads of these publications, <coughs> nowhere on it can you actually find a definition of social justice. Only in a 2010 interview, the one I just mentioned in the New Statesman, has he ever attempted to define it. And so here's Ian Duncan Smith with a definition of social justice, which I love reading. I mean to improve the quality of people's lives, which gives people the opportunity to improve their lives. In other words, so people's quality of life is improved. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it's almost like I'm reading the work of my undergraduates. <laughs> um, okay, so in 2006, the Centre for Social Justice produced a voluminous document uh, entitled Breakdown Britain, the end product of Ian Duncan Smith being invited by David Cameron to consider how an incoming Conservative government could tackle Britain's most acute social problems. Uh, Duncan Smith convened five working groups to conduct surveys and report back on five pathways to poverty, as they define them. And they were family breakdown, educational failure, economic dependence, indebtedness, and addiction. And they refer to these as the drivers of poverty, and if they're not addressed, an ever-growing underclass will be created. So when reading this document, I was struck actually by the accuracy of an observation made by Jamie Peck when writing about think tanks in the United States. And he says that the intellectuals employed by these think tanks to produce these kinds of publications. They portray themselves as lonely voices of reason, as principled outsiders in a corrupt, distracted, and wrong-headed world. Um, in the Breakdown Britain report, considerable attention was given to family breakdown, and the central tenets of the infamous underclass thesis lie in the centre for social justice's definition of familial strife. Uh, we have adopted an inclusive use of the term family breakdown, which can be summed up in three key words, dissolution, dysfunction, and my favourite, dadlessness. Um, yes. Over two decades ago, um, political scientist Charles Murray visited London at the invitation of Rupert Murdoch, um, and he recommended to policy elites, journalists, and think tank officials that the civilising force of marriage be the treatment for the spreading disease of an underclass of single mothers and absent fathers. This argument has long been thoroughly discredited by many people. But the Centre for Social Justice has resuscitated it in almost every publication on its website. And here's an example. The policy-making community has been markedly reluctant to grasp the nettle of family breakdown by being clear about the benefits of marriage and committed relationships and the merits of supporting and encouraging them. For the Centre for Social Justice, there is no social problem for which promoting marriage is not the solution. It is desperate to guard against any views to the contrary. For example, when a distinguished welfare historian, Pat Finney, <coughs> he argued that the think tank presents a misleading and empirically inaccurate portrait of a British past filled with happy families, the CSJ responded quickly within one week with an aggrieved 24-page rebuttal written by two legal scholars. 
Um, so determined is David Cameron to force an acceptance of the social benefits uh, of marriage that he chose Father's Day in 2011 to write a column in the Sunday Telegraph uh, with these words. I think we need to make Britain a genuinely hostile place for fathers uh, who go AWOL. It's high time runaway dads were stigmatized and the full force of shame was heaped upon them. They should be looked at like drink drivers, people who are beyond the pale. So this is the Prime Minister of the UK and his rhetoric about um, what causes poverty. It's quite disturbing stuff, I think. In order to give scientific credibility to punishing the poor, the Centre for Social Justice has mastered the craft of what I call decision-based evidence-making. Despite claims of evidence-based policy in all the publications of this think tank, politicians rarely consult published social science research unless it supports the policies that they want to pursue. Witness, for instance, that not a single social scientist was a member of any of the think tank's working groups studying their five pathways to poverty. Instead, they depend on neat sound bites from surveys that measure nothing more than the world view of the think tank that commissions them. This is taken uh, from the methodological appendices to the Breakdown Britain report, just one of the survey questions asked of a supposedly representative sample. The evidence was never going to show anything different with respect to the supposed causes and prevention of family breakdown. These reaped surveys provide the evidence base, to use the language of think tank posturing, for the mobilization of state power in the extension of conservative dogma. They actively manufacture ignorance to appease their funders, shielding audiences from autonomous scholarship and from any viable alternatives. Uh, as Jerry Mooney and Lynn Hancock, uh, who've written the most on the broken society rhetoric, as they, as they have explained, a specific geography is at work in this broken society narrative. Social housing estates, or areas where these dominate, and the populations therein are frequently highlighted and represented as particular locales where social pathologies and problems flourish. The broken society narrative summons the semantic battering ram of the welfare ghetto, a place characterized by worklessness, welfare dependency, criminality, and disorder. In 2009, Ian Duncan Smith said this in a, so in a Center for Social Justice uh, report. I have no hesitation in claiming that Britain is broken. This claim is factual. Britain's social housing estates, once stepping stones of opportunity, are now ghettos for our poorest people. Too many people live in dysfunctional homes trapped on benefits. Too many communities are blighted by alcohol and drug addiction, debt and criminality. Life expectancy on some estates, where often three generations of the same family have never worked, is lower than the Gaza Strip. We are seeing a marked expansion of the dysfunctional base of our society. So the think tank and now government explanation for urban poverty is one rooted in what have become known as neighborhood effects. This is an understanding of society that adheres to one overarching assumption, that where you live affects your life chances. Applied to people living at the bottom of the class structure, it infers that the influences of what surrounds them have caused their poverty. It's all about negative role models and miscreants mired in a culture of concentrated poverty that stops people rising up and finding a better life and escaping their neighborhood. Stripped of its prosaic veneer, the, neighbor, the neighborhood effects model assumes that poverty feeds on itself and that the demographic context of poor neighborhoods instills dysfunctional norms values and behaviours into individuals and triggers a cycle of social pathology and poverty that few residents escape. And I should say that the study of neighbourhood effects is it, even one of its main proponents, uh, sociologist Robert Sampson actually said recently, this is a cottage industry, uh, this, the study of neighbourhood effects. Um, it's fascinating also that Ian Duncan Smith has drawn upon some urban scholarship, famous urban scholarship, to hammer home his argument. Uh, Elijah Anderson, for example, so he says this in one of the uh, think tank reports. What exercises me, perhaps more than anything else, is the very scale of these problems, the creeping expansion of this underclass, the way decent people, to use Elijah Anderson's phrase, are sucked into and governed by the code of the street. We've already heard this referred to by a couple of people so far. Uh, Anderson describes the most powerful counteracting force to the negative influences of the inner city as a strong, loving, decent family committed to uh, mainstream pro-social values. And I, I use this quotation to show the political implications of, of some scholarship which endorses this view that where you live affects your life chances. Another example, he also refers to the UK uh, criminologist John Pitts. Uh, as he observes from his research, given the choice, it is far better to come from a troubled family in a good neighborhood than a good family in a troubled neighborhood. 
this is, this is where the blemish of place actually starts to affect policy decisions. It is no longer enough to come from a decent family. Now, it would be harsh and unfair to pin punitive welfare reforms in the UK from, uh, on Anderson and Pitts, of course. But it does raise fundamental questions, as I said, about the, the political implications of this belief that where you live affects your life chances. And I have a paper that's coming out in the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research uh, next year, probably, that addresses an absolutely fundamental structural question that is never tabled at these gatherings of neighborhood effects uh, scholars. And that question is, why do people live where they do in cities? If where any given individual lives affects their life chances as deeply as neighborhood effects believers say, it seems crucial to understand why that individual is living there in the first place. Um, and it has, it has long been a scientific fact and predicament that in most cities of the world there are neighborhoods of astounding affluence uh, and neighborhoods of persistent poverty, often side by side. Life chances will of course be very different for residents of these very different neighborhoods, but stating the obvious and controlling for various externalities, which is usually the methodology adopted, that does not explain why such urban inequality exists. So by examining the structural factors that give rise to differential life chances and the inequalities they produce, we can actually invert the neighborhood effects thesis to your life chances affect where you live. And so that's uh, what I've been arguing um, recently, a paper coming out next year. Um, the UK government is determined to present the economic crisis in Britain as something attributable to the corrosive effects of welfare. In this respect, the generations who have never worked in a welfare ghetto image is very useful in garnering support for the savage gutting of the welfare state. But the image is a spectre. A recent quantitative study that explored whether worklessness is intergenerational found even two-generational worklessness to be very rare, as workless parents and grown-up children are found together in only 0.9% of all households in the UK. In respect of three-generational worklessness, and you often hear third-generational worklessness used by Ian Duncan Smith and David Cameron all the time when they're referring to these particular urban districts, the fraction drops further to less than 0.1% of the total of UK households. Different methodologies produce the same conclusions. Recent qualitative work conducted in Glasgow and Teesside, two parts of the UK that are regularly stereotyped and stigmatised to present the case for welfare reform, they showed that intergenerational worklessness is a myth. Uh, despite an extensive search, we failed to find any families where three generations had never worked and only found two families where two generations had never worked. So the intergenerational reality is not a case of parents and their children and their grandchildren being trapped in welfare ghettos uh, or choosing not to work because of the, the amazing generosity of the welfare state, but rather one of permanent insecurity uh, and precarity created by a, created by a very hostile entry-level labour market, which leads people of all generations to flip between low-wage and temporary work and unemployment. That's well documented with statistical evidence available. So to conclude then, um, in December uh, last year, the, the Guardian newspaper, together with the London School of Economics, they published a report entitled Reading the Riots, which drew on in-depth, primarily qualitative interviews conducted by sociologists at LSE, with 270 people who were directly involved in the riots. The aim of this, uh, the aim of this project was to understand who had been involved and what their motivations were. Some of the findings are very revealing. And there's one of them. They expressed it in different ways, but at heart what the rioters talked about was a pervasive sense of injustice. For some this was economic, the lack of a job, money or opportunity. For others it was more broadly social, not just the absence of material things, but how they felt they were treated compared with others. Those interviewed were a group who felt dislocated from the opportunities they saw as available to others in the UK. When asked if they felt part of British society, only 51% said they agreed with the statement against 92% of the population as a whole. For the young in particular, and more than four-fifths of those interviewed were aged 24 or under, what came across was a profound sense of alienation. As one North Londoner in his mid-twenties put it, when no one cares about you, you're going to eventually make them care. You're going to cause a disturbance. The sense of being invisible was widespread. In some cases, the view that change was impossible was palpable. Asked what he would like to see change, one 19-year-old unemployed man from Birmingham simply said, fuck knows, don't know, don't really care about that no more. I've gone past caring. I just think there's no point in me wishing, wanting things to happen. 
So the institutional failures that have hammered youth in recent times have produced a response that really should have been expected. There was a, a sort of a sense of surprise among policy elites and politicians about how these riots could happen in our country. We could have expected these things. Recent European history from suburban France to the sidewalks of Athens show that if young people are robbed of a sense that they have a dignified future awaiting them, they will take to the streets. When considering the abysmal record of income inequality under the 13-year Labour government, uh, record high youth unemployment and the commodification of education, and now an economic crisis being addressed by a brutal series of budget cuts to social welfare, rather than the redistributive path, which is increasing taxation of corporations and the wealthy, one can begin to grasp the feelings of shared indignity and dishonour among a generation that feels abandoned and betrayed. Given the context of the worst recession in Britain since the 1930s, one might reasonably assume that a broken society would refer to Britain's financial sector and its entire regulatory apparatus. But it speaks volumes about the state of public debate on poverty in Britain that a broken society refers entirely to poor people and the places where they live. David Cameron stated of the rioters, there are pockets of our society that are not just broken, but are frankly sick. The Centre for Social Justice shaped this perspective, which makes his audience look away from the top of the class structure, where a complete lack of responsibility, to use Cameron's own words, can be found in what looks like an increasingly broken state. And I'll stop. Could you elaborate a bit further how that was the case? Well, the, as I said, Robert Sampson, sociologist based in Chicago, um, he argued actually 10 years ago that neighborhood effects has become a cottage industry. And there is a, uh, a really, if you look at the amount of out, just intellectual output in terms of books and especially journal articles and conferences, on this particular theme, it's quite, quite astonishing. When I started to look at the literature, I mean, it's just, you, you can't review it. It's <coughs> so enormous. And the literature is, um, th there's something going on there in that literature, which is an assumption, a belief, that neighborhoods cause poverty. And what the job of the social scientist is to do is to conduct research to find out how neighborhoods cause poverty and how people uh, not just how people sort into neighbourhoods, but the effects of neighbourhoods in, in people's lives. And the, uh, it's most advanced in policy circles in the United States. There was an experiment uh, called Moving to Opportunity, um, which uh, was, a, um, it was designed by academics. Uh, it was a federal government experiment where people in housing projects uh, in uh, very poor neighbourhoods were given vouchers. Uh, to well, well, there were three groups of people. One group was given a voucher, which would um, a Section 8 voucher, which is a rent subsidy for the use in the private market. Another group were given uh, a voucher that would move them to the suburbs, and another group stayed in public housing. So that was a control group. And uh, the effect. Of what's interesting about this study is that the. Uh, the data which has emerged, and there's truckloads of data, show that neighborhood effects are actually quite weak. In that actually, the people who had moved to lower poverty neighborhoods, with a couple of exceptions to some variables, for example, I think it was uh, the education of young women, and the health, and the mental health of, uh, I think, young women. Um, generally, there was no effect, right, of moving people to these areas. Uh, so even though a big experiment was conducted, this argument that neighborhoods cause poverty, it kind of called that into question. But yet, this industry is, keeps on going. And I use the Elijah Anderson and John Pitts quotations to show that this is a belief which is very attractive to people who are interested in not just housing, but residential mobility, but welfare reform. Because if, the, if, there, are, if there is somehow academic legitimacy for this view that where you live is the problem, then uh, we need to, first of all, think about where we might move people to, 
Um, but secondly, you know, there is, a, there is a, like a sort of poverty culture that is created, and therefore we can treat welfare as a behavioural thing. Um, am I, does that answer your, yeah. your response? So, so there is a real policy uptake of, a, of, a, of an assumption that neighbourhoods cause poverty, despite actually rather weak evidence for neighbourhood effects, not just in the UK actually, but the Netherlands as well, where there's also a big industry researching this. Just one, yes. Could you please make more explicit your criticism of using missing father point in this political discourse? Why, why does this bother you so strongly? What's, what's, what's mm. the... Okay. Um, because you just you mentioned it, but you didn't really Yeah, there is a big gender dimension to what is going on, <coughs> in that, uh, okay, there is a, a, a belief uh, a very strongly held view uh, among the members of the Conservative Party, right at the very top and all the way down the Conservative Party, that uh, if a, uh, a couple get married and stay together, then that would be beneficial for um, the life chances of people in poverty. Uh, despite the fact that they produce their own surveys to demonstrate this, right? And these are rigged surveys that are only going to show that. Okay, so there hasn't actually... I mean, I, I really should actually investigate whether there is any research that demonstrates this. I don't know if there is, it demonstrates the contrary or no effects of an absent father. But uh, the, what's interesting is that uh, gender is at work two ways. <coughs> so there is a view that a woman cannot raise children by herself if she is poor. Okay? And there's also a view that there is uh, there's a, another gender dimension in that uh, it is um, it's an, uh, there is no explanation for why fathers are absent. Okay, and we're told it's an epidemic that dadlessness is something which is a spreading disease. Uh, instead of ask why there are inc uh, why there is an increase in female-headed households. There is just instead, well, it's we should stigmatize and blame fathers. And we don't know if people have left households because there is no work. We don't know if the rising rates of incarceration in the UK, which have tripled since 1997, uh, and which are strongly male, we don't know if there's an element going on there. So in a way, it's a, there is a very simplistic treatment of dadlessness, which is blaming an absent father just for being absent rather than asking why is that father absent and also there is blame on women that they cannot look after, they cannot possibly raise a child responsibly by themselves, they should be married because then they'll, you know, they have the male support. So it's really quite disturbing gender dimensions of what is going on. Okay, how's that? Oh, okay.